KCOD Broadcasting weaves the listening environments of 99.9 WQRC, Ocean 104.7, WFCC Classical 107.5, Cape Country 104, and KCOD.com's website experience to reflect the lifestyles of the people who live, work, and play on Cape Cod. We hope that you enjoy this podcast. I'm Matt McCarthy, and this is Sunday Journal. I'm joined this morning by Peter McMahon. He's the executive director of the Cape Cod Modern House Trust. He's also the co-author of a new book, Cape Cod Modern Mid-Century Architecture and the Community on the Outer Cape. Peter, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. Well, thanks for having me. Let's start with an overview of your nonprofit, uh, Cape Cod Modern House Trust, because this is a very unique organization. Uh, What is it, and, and how did you start it? Okay, well, um, I grew up in a modern house in Wellfleet in the summer designed by a guy named Charlie Zender, who um, was one of the modern architects on the Outer Cape. And I went to architecture school and uh, came back to the Cape and curated a project, uh, a show at the Provincetown Art Museum on um, the modern architecture. This is 2006. Um, there, there was, there is an amazing collection of experimental modern architecture on the Outer Cape, um, which was really pretty unknown, even though many of the architects were famous in the outside world. And why, why was that? I mean, why were there so many uh, examples of that type of work? So, um, two things happened in parallel um, in the in the late '30s. So, Walter Gropius, who is the founder of the Bauhaus School in Germany, a very famous school of design. Uh, he was hired by Harvard to come and teach um, the modern curriculum to Harvard students. And so he came um, and spent a summer on in Marion on um, Planting Island at sticking out in Buzzards Bay and collected this huge group of, of people who were ex-Bauhaus teachers who all came to the U.S. in 37 and spread out and started teaching uh, the Bauhaus curriculum. Also in Wellfleet, there were a group of kind of – we call them Bohemian Brahmins who were um, sort of self-taught. Um, artistic bohemians who moved to the Wealth Fleet when it was very, very cheap. Land was $25 an acre. It was, it was really a depopulated Cape during the Depression, Outer Cape. So they had come out there and either bought or inherited huge pieces of land um, and started kind of experimenting building mo- what they had modern – imitating modern architecture they had seen. None of them were trained. And then through intermediaries, they invited Gropius, uh, Marcel Breuer, Serge Tremayev, um, and the Saarinen family and, and a lot of their students and friends. So through friends, they, this two, these two groups met and these modern – European modern architects who were recent refugees came out to Wellfleet and Truro and bought land and started building their, their summer houses. No, that's fascinating. Now, you founded this trust, uh, the Cape Cod Modern House Trust, in, in effort, in my understanding, to help save some of these these houses. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. So in the research for the show I did in 2006, um, I started talking to the park because the park owns a lot of buildings that had sort of fallen into limbo. And it turned out the park owned a group of really important uh, mid-20th century modern houses which were derelict um, and were actually supposed to be torn down. Um, The park didn't realize they had any historically significant modern houses. So we started negotiating with the park. Uh, We formed a nonprofit so that we could um, negotiate leases. And we now have three of those houses leased and fully restored. So we rent them in the summer and then we do an, an artist and scholar residency in the shoulder seasons to try to bring that artistic mojo back to the the buildings of this creative community, which is uh, mostly gone at this point. And what was that process like? So as you mentioned, you have these three houses that you've been able to restore. You were able to, to work with the National Park Service. Uh, wh- when did you start uh, working on these homes? And, and and kind of what are your future plans now? You've saved these three homes. Do you have any plans to, to look at some more in the future? Um, we started the process in 2008. We applied for our first lease and we restored that building and we have just restored one in the, in the last two years, two in the last two years, one um, this year and one last year. Um, so we are a small organization and we're going to uh, – we're kind of going to stop for the time being and, and sort of consolidate financially because we've been overextended trying to get these last two buildings done. We've relied heavily on Community Preservation Act and Wellfleet um, who have given, been our biggest funder. They do have funds for historic restoration. Once we p- could – 
once we could convince more than half the people in Wellfleet Town Meeting that these were historic buildings, then we were <laughs> eligible. I'm talking with Peter McMahon. Thank you so much for joining us here today on Sunday Journal. Peter is the executive director of the Cape Cod Modern House Trust. He's also the co-author of a new book, Cape Cod Modern Mid-Century Architecture and the Community on the Outer Cape. We'll get to that in just a moment. I'm really fascinated by your organization. It's, it's a very unique organization. Are you finding you know, that more and more people, as, as you've been around for a couple of years now, are you finding that more and more people are becoming interested in these modern houses because of the work that your organization is doing? Yeah, there's a there's a big groundswell of interest in t- mid twentieth century modern uh, design in all of its forms. Um, this is partly uh, just an accident of history. Um, it's it's been you know they've been it, a long enough t- period of time has passed so that people are are fascinated with this. It's also just kind of a golden age of American design because you had these. European sort of the cream creme de la creme of European designers were skimmed off and relocated here and taught in the U.S. universities, and that created this great flowering of um, creativity in this country. So, um, and the Cape, you know, the, the, these modern houses, there's over a hundred of them um, on the Outer Cape, really were sort of a missing chapter in this story. So there's there's modern architecture in Palm Springs and New Canaan, Connecticut and Sarasota, Florida, there are these pockets. But because of the isolated nature of these buildings and uh, they're out in the woods at the end of long dirt roads and and also the when these this group of people out here they were they were kind of kept to themselves. So there's a very unknown kind of a, the unwritten chapter of the history of this uh, architecture. And you mentioned you have these roughly 100 homes out in the Outer Cape, these modern homes. In your opinion, you know, in your view, how many of these homes are worth saving? You've been able to save three so far. I mean, what, kind of what's the long-term goal as you look to the future of these homes? Well, you know, 95% of these are um, are privately owned. So they're, they're just they're, – a lot of them are in the park, but they're pre-59, 1959 houses, so they're privately owned. So their fates are really in the owners um, and a lot of people who own modern houses are starting to get more you know aware of the their provenance and proud of them and taking care of them a lot of them are kind of fragile buildings and not not easy to uh, you know to sort of restore and renovate so um, I think there's a there's a lot of awareness and pride in the in this kind of piece of our history. I mean, the Outer Cape has always attracted. It's always been kind of the Grand Central Station of the fascinating people of the 20th century. You know, you had Norman Mailer and you had uh, you know um, Marlon Brando living <laughs> here for a little while, and and just everyone you can name: politicians, artists, scientists, and then all the people who are teaching at Harvard and MIT and Yale who are coming here in the summer. So there was this incredible. Uh, kind of nexus of thinkers and uh, creative people in the mid-20th century. And these buildings are kind of the, uh, the what was left behind. And I know you've worked with folks in Wellfleet. I know you'd mentioned you've been you know, relying on some Community Preservation Act funds uh, for these projects. What's been the community response to this? How are people feeling about this? And, and how have you seen uh, that response grow over the course of, of your, uh, your tenure with this organization? Well, there's a lot of people still around who had something to do with this. Either, either their, you know, their, their father was a carpenter that worked on them or they were family friends with the parents or grandparents. You know, uh, and, and so there's a lot of connections still um, in Wellfleet. And then, you know, locally there's a great deal of interest. And then, I, you know, Wellfleet Marketplace, the grocery store in Wellfleet, has sold 300 copies of our book. So that's a little <laughs> indication of how popular it is. I think the Orleans uh, one has only sold three copies. So it's a little bit of a epicenter. I mean, a lot of our, um, you know, People are a lot of our fans are in New York or all over the elsewhere, you know, England, people in Italy. You know, we've we got a ton of press from the book all over Europe and all over the U.S. So, I mean, the the, the really the reason for the book is that we have accumulated so much information through collecting oral histories, um, searching archives, and then our original research where we would measure buildings and document them if there was no documentation. So we really reached a critical mass of material. We really had to get it out there 
um, in a book. I'm Matt McCarthy, and you're listening to Sunday Journal. Thank you so much for joining us. We're joined this morning by Peter McMahon. He's the executive director of the Cape Cod Modern House Trust. He's also just written a book. It's called Cape Cod Modern Mid-Century Architecture and Community on the Outer Cape, and, and you had mentioned it. You know, I, I'd love to get into this. It's, it's a fascinating book. Uh, you had mentioned that there's kind of been this groundswell and this all this information is piled up as you've been doing this. How long had you been working on the book before you got it published? Well, we were collecting material for about eight years, and then it was two years of serious writing. My co-author, Christine Cipriani, is a you know professional writer and editor, which was a huge help because I'm not really – um, so we really took turns. It's really the book is really a series of biographies, and so we took turns writing them and then trading them back. And it was actually a really good, good experience. Now, do you look at individual pieces of architecture on, on the Outer Cape in the book? You know, kind of what does it focus on? Yeah, I mean, the book is organized. The first chapter is really from the glaciers up to 1937. So we really describe the landscape, the particular landscape of the Cape, which was so important. Um, And also the history of provisional buildings, of buildings which are moved or temporary or floated over somewhere else or taken apart and recombined. And this was a big inspiration to the modern architects. They were very into vernacular architecture. Um, Then we do a whole series of biographies of all the architects and then we have a last chapter that's about sort of the 60s and 70s and the end of this period. Do you have a particular, you know, kind of favorite era? Because we're we're talking about, you know, the mid-century, the mid-20th century and this. Do you kind of have a a really, you know, favorite part of the book or a favorite piece of architecture that you've, you know, you've covered and you've gathered information on? Is there something that just really stands out to you? Yeah, I'm very – myself, I'm very fascinated with Marcel Breuer who was – one of the most important American modern architects, he was Hungarian by way of Germany and England, but he was became a very important mod, uh, American modern architect. He designed the Whitney Museum in New York and the UNESCO headquarters. And But um, he also designed very famous furniture, which you see everywhere, which is he invented tubular steel furniture. So it's it's um, – I find him a very fascinating guy because his little – his smallest design – is related to his biggest design. You can see this sort of line through of his thought process um, from the biggest decision to the smallest decision. Yeah. Now, I know you've given tours of these homes in the summer uh, in the past, uh, these homes that you've saved, uh, helped to save and restore three homes on the Outer Cape. How popular have those tours been? I mean, have people really been interested in getting out to, to see the work that you and your organization have done? Oh yeah, we always sell out um, every year, and there's there's great demand. We also we do a big tour in August, but we also do many small tours. If you become a member, you get a, you know a small tour for up to ten people. Um, so we're doing those constantly. Yeah, and that's so the, be, becoming a member of the Cape Cod Modern House Trust is that correct? Yes. And yeah. how many people do you have involved in your organization? Oh, hundreds. I I, I can't tell you at the, at any given moment, but. Um, a great many. We had a we had a very successful Kickstarter campaign for our last house, which was the Widlinger House, uh, which we just finished um, completed this summer, and um, that was huge um, and really was a great way to galvanize to really see how many people really supported the project in a, in a tangible way. And I know we had chatted a little bit about that project in the past. Wondering for for our listeners who may not be as familiar with it, wondering if you could share a little bit about what that project uh, was all about. Mm-hmm. So the Weidlinger House was built in 1953 by Paul Weidlinger, also Hungarian. It's a very important engineer who kind of invented blast proofing and earthquake proofing of structures. That was his thing. And, and his firm is still a huge international firm, although he's passed away. And he was the favorite structural engineer for Breuer Gropius. He worked with Corbu, Le Corbusier and um, – many of the greats. And he built this little house um, on Higgins Pond in Wellfleet. And it sat empty for 18 years. Basically, through some uh, accident of history, it ended up abandoned and owned by the park. So um, this was the longest, uh, the most, you know, the longest period of of abandonment that we had dealt with. So this this house was really in bad shape. And it looks fantastic now. So it's it, this one's very gratifying. And, you know, what are some of the comments you hear from people who have maybe come out to see, you know, the finished product? I mean, what are you hearing from people when they come out to see these homes that you've been able to restore? 
uh, disbelief often because they they saw them when they were ruined and most people thought they should just be torn down because they were such wreck. I mean this house looked like – speaking of blast proofing, it looked like a bomb had gone off in it. Yeah. And you know, you've talked in the past about these homes being endangered. I mean how close – I mean how truly close were some of these homes to being torn down? Well, um, some of them were torn down. Actually, the park tore down a couple by Charlie Zender. Um, so, you know, they they were um, – you know, the park is a very slow-moving organization and buildings really aren't their fo- – is not their focus. So um, there was some just uh, benign or malign neglect, you know, going on. But it was mostly just it wasn't on their agenda. So they just were sitting empty. And how has your partnership been with the National Park Service? Obviously, you've been working with the National Seashore to, you know, to help get some of these homes and to restore them. What's your partnership been like uh, over the course of your organization? Oh, well, it's very, um, you know, I, I mean, we wouldn't exist without the park, really. We, we formed the organization, in, out of, which came out of discussions with the park's historian um, about what to do with these houses. So um, we relied really very heavily on the town of Wellfleet and on the park service, and really it's been a group effort. And Peter, for people who are interested in learning more, you know, maybe want to learn more about your organization, maybe get involved with the Cape Cod Modern House Trust, how do they go about reaching you? What, what's a good way to, to learn a bit more about what you're doing and to learn more about your book uh, as well? Well, just go to our website and check it out. It's Cape Cod Modern House Trust. Just Google it and you'll find it. Um, and get the book. The book really is the entire history, the whole big story with a lot of amazing archival photos as well as new, amazing new photos taken by um, a very talented photographer. So the book really is tells you the whole story and it's very readable and accessible. It's There's not a lot of uh, – architect lingo in there. So you've saved three houses. You've written a book about all these houses. What's next for you? I need to take a rest. <laughs> <laughs> Resting up for now. <laughs> yes. Well, Peter McMahon with the Cape Cod Modern House Trust. Uh, he is the executive director and the co-author of the new book, Cape Cod Modern Mid-Century Architecture and Community on the Outer Cape. Thank you so much for joining us on Sunday Journal. And please uh, do keep us posted on, on what you and your organization are doing. It's very cool stuff. And thank you so much for coming in this morning. Thank Thanks a lot. I'm Matt McCarthy, and this is Sunday Journal. This podcast is a presentation of Cape Cod Broadcasting, which is solely responsible for its content. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit us at capecodbroadcasting.com.